Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. There's no message quite like this in all of history. On this night, heaven spills over onto earth, eternity breaks into time, and God has made man. Our Savior has arrived. If your house is anything like mine, there are boxes everywhere. Over the last month, there's been almost a continuous flow of Amazon and UPS deliveries to the house. And these gifts have been unpacked and wrapped in beautiful paper and bows and placed under the tree. There they await to be gleefully opened by a child or sleepily unwrapped by an adult. But what do we see when we look at the gift God has given us? The contrast couldn't be more stark, could it? Despite the quaint paintings, that first Christmas was really an austere moment. The greatest gift ever given was not wrapped in royal clothes and placed into a palace to reign. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a manger to sleep. It was an unassuming entrance. The residents of Bethlehem went on with their lives as they always had cooking and eating, working and sleeping, unaware that anything was different in their world. Despite their perception, though, the truth was, everything had just changed. That baby lying in the manger was the Savior, was Christ the Lord. And tonight, over 2,000 years later, we gather together. Our gifts have been ordered and wrapped and are sitting under our trees We too go about our days cooking and eating, working and sleeping, but are we really aware of what we celebrate tonight? Do we realize that the world has changed because of that baby in the manger? Because of the gift God has given us, that everything is different. Yet despite the Christmas buzz around us, many people still wonder, why does the manger matter? It's a fair question. Do we simply celebrate tonight out of nostalgia, because it's just what we do on Christmas Eve, or is it something more? Why does the manger matter? Now, the second chapter of Luke gives us the most detailed birth narrative in the Bible. That's why it's read every Christmas. That's why Linus read it during the Peanuts Christmas special. It's the most detailed one we've got. And Luke's account is important because it roots the incarnation in a real time and in a real place. It's not a fairy tale. It doesn't begin with once upon a time in a land far away. It begins with a specific setting. Verses 1 through 4. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And they all went to be registered, each to his own hometown. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. This entire setting, as Luke sets this up, is remarkably specific. It's anchored in reality, in our world. And that should be a reminder and a comfort to us all. Our God is not a God that must be sought through mystical experience or ethereal pursuits. In this event, we see that God comes to meet us where we are, how we are, in the world in which we live. Why? Because he knew that this is where we need him. The only way the manger matters, truly matters, is if the babe in it that lies in it, it's truly God with us here in the daily grind of life. And it's with this conviction we begin to see why the manger matters. But the answer to that question ultimately lies with the angelic messenger. Verses 8 through 11 say, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. 
Notice that the explanation for the event doesn't come from a man. Not from a preacher, not from a teacher, not even from a prophet. The significance of this event is explained by an angel, a messenger from heaven. And that's no small point. It shows us that the origin and meaning of the manger is not based in the invention of man, but in the generous self-revelation of God. Also notice the angel's message, fear not. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news. On the one hand, you can understand how the sudden appearance of an angel might be startling or even frightening. So the angel, it seems natural that he would say, fear not, to calm the shepherds by his greeting. On the other hand, it seems, there seems to be more to this greeting, especially when you put it side by side with the assurance for good news. The people to whom this message was first announced would have had a number of reasons to fear. They were living in fear-filled days. Their land was occupied by oppressors. Their nation had been taken over by the Romans. The whole point of the census which drew Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem was for taxation. Their religion was held in suspicion by the Romans, and they viewed the Jews largely as an annoyance. Any uprising or treason was swiftly and brutally stamped out. They were living in difficult days. And I believe the opening line of the angel's message has something to say to us. Fear not. We too live in a time of great uncertainty. We see political division in our day, the rise of tribalism, the rejection of much of the Christian worldview and moral teaching, we see laws being made that have great implications for the Christian church in this society. We face economic uncertainty as well as the increase of global conflict and instability. And it seems like every time one thing calms down, something else flares up. Many of us live with a simmering sense of frustration and anxiety and maybe even fear. But it is into this situation, whether it be in the first century or the 21st century, that we need to hear the angel's words, fear not. Why? Because in this event, in the manger, we see the wisdom and the sovereignty of God. In the incarnate babe in the manger, we understand that God has acted. God has come to us. He has entered our world in its troubles, in its uncertainty, and in its pain. And because he entered into the difficult century, the first century, you can rest assured that he will be in it in the 21st century as well. Fear not. God is with us. Emmanuel. Then the angel reveals more of his message. It's like he anticipates the next question. How can I fear not? He says, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. This is not just God acting in some general way. This is God acting on our behalf. What this shows to us is not only that God has given us not a message of hopeless condemnation. He has not given us a motivational speech to simply tell us to try harder. He is bringing good news of great joy for all people. And some days it seems like good news is in short supply, doesn't it? For the Christian, even in the midst of hardship, there is still good news. That's the very essence of the word gospel. It literally means good news. But it isn't just good news in general. It's for all people. It's not just good news for a few, for a certain elite spiritual group who can attain it. It's for all the people. And what is the good news? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's the heart of the entire announcement. That's the point of the entire event. And it ultimately is the answer to the question, why does the manger matter? This gift, this child, is born unto you. Did you notice that? He didn't just say this child has been born. He said this child has been born unto you. The angel is speaking to the shepherds and by extension to us. It is for us that he came. It wasn't so that God could simply flex his might or display his power. 
though that event certainly does it. It was for us. What the angel announces is not just the birth of a child, but the coming of the Christ, the anointed one, the Son of God. And according to this message, He is our Savior. He is our Lord. God has come near. But He's come near for a particular purpose. As Savior, He will take the penalty we deserve on Himself. He who became man for us will also become sin for us. I mentioned 1 Timothy last week, and it bears repeating. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 1 John 4.10, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. There's a quote that comes around every year at Christmas. And I have yet to figure out who said it first, but I think it hits the mark. It is, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, he would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a savior. This is why the manger matters. As we celebrate the incarnation tonight, I pray you allow these truths to sink deep into your hearts. We have been given a gift unlike any other. And the implications of the incarnation are profound. And probably no one said it better than C.S. Lewis when he said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. But if true, is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. In the incarnation, we see that God comes to us. It had to be that way. We could never reach God on our own. We could not think a thought high enough. We could not live a life good enough to enter into his presence. If we were to truly know God and be in relationship with him, it had to be by him coming to us. And he does. The incarnation demonstrates his great love precisely because he enters into our world. But this truth can be applied to each of us personally. He will enter into your world, into your life, into the messiness and pain and fear and guilt and doubt that you experience. And he will say with authority, fear not. Because he has come. The good news of this night is not only that God has come, but in understanding why he has come. The angel announced that this child is the Savior, the Christ, the Lord, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the Redeemer who will make all things new. He is the conqueror of death, as we say in the Eucharistic prayer, who has trampled hell and Satan under his feet. He is the Lord the one we love and follow and obey. Why does the manger matter? Because the incarnation makes knowing God possible. It makes knowing God as Savior and Lord possible. And it shows us that we either know Him as Savior and Lord, or we do not know Him at all. Why does the manger matter? Because in that manger lies the hope of humanity. In that manger lies our redemption before God. In that manger lies the path of life. Why does the manger matter? Because in the incarnation, everything changes. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.